a playlist original. I'm scared. I hear guns. I'll just buy crackers. You're safe and solid. You guys got plans for the night? Head out to the city. Why don't you take the train out there? One night. That way you guys can hang out and not have to worry about anything. We'll change a family. Next stop, Fruitvale Station. Get off the train now! One moment. We just trying to get home. We'll ignite a city. Somebody help! Oh my God. Put that phone away. What are you do? Fruitvale Station. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Back to the Blockbuster with your hosts, Gaius and Jackson. Anniversary episode number one, you said 112? Is that what episode one, we're on? Episode now? 112, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's where we're just uh, chugging through these, man. <laughs> yeah, we certainly are, man. It feels like uh, hundreds way in the rear view. Um, I know. <laughs> were, what was the last uh, anniversary cover? Was it The Dark Knight? Dark Knight, yeah. As of recording, and, uh, we yeah. had a and we had a full house for that one. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was fun though. Oh, we handled it well though. I thought. I mean, it was seven of us. Yeah. And that was a blast. Uh, your first time with that many people. Usually, it's only been like what three or four. And yeah, four at the max. Uh, so that was yeah. Uh, so big lift for yeah, us. Yeah, they but, were uh, great guests. Yeah, they okay. definitely they definitely were good. Yeah, they were awesome. They were a lot of fun yeah. and well, engaging. Certainly. So, just the two of us today, though, uh, with a heavy, heavy flick today. I'm just uh, yeah, just off my very first ever watch of Fruitvale Station, just turned 10 in July. Um, Ryan Coogler of uh, Black Panther fame's uh, directorial debut, at least feature length directorial debut. And uh, yeah. kind of like, a, I guess, a mid-career but breakout performance from Michael B. Jordan. And man, let me just say, like, first movie to, to get a tear out of me in a, in a while. That one hit, dude. That was a... Uh, really impactful yeah film. yeah it's um so it was interesting because you know for all of you that, that know we have like the anniversary calendar like we shared on like the google drive and like each month so far it's been like hey which one do you want to do like which one can we kind of cut and july right i thought that because jackson loves the conjuring i was like oh he's gonna pick that to do uh <laughs> instead but then like we have this whole like Halloween thing plan, and you're like, okay, we can like maybe do that then, right? And Still I was like, oh, which ones? Later. Yeah, and I was like, well, which ones do you want to do? And I was actually surprised that you picked this one uh, to be like a definite one, uh, and I, I was pleasantly surprised. It's a, it's a really good movie. I, I'll be honest with you, I hadn't watched uh, Fruitville Station since around the time it came out because it's so heavy and it was so hard to watch. Like my first thought was like. That was really good, but I don't know if I ever want to watch that again. So this was I, actually my s- second time watching it uh, I for had this. The exact same thing when I closed my laptop down. Normally I would watch on my TV, but I just, yeah. as I mentioned off camera, was just coming off a watch of True Romance, so I just was in my room and threw it on my laptop, which made for a more intimate watching experience. Yeah, yeah. I thought the exact same thing. I was like, damn, like movies like that, they're rare when they hit like that. But uh, I think it'll be some years, some distance before I get something like that in again but uh i'm glad that i watched it i'm really glad that i had set my mind on you know covering that this this month because yeah. this is um uh as we know my my buddy cam uh he's recommended many movies to me this is one he's sworn by for a long time and when i saw it on the anniversary calendar i said i can't put this one off anymore i really this will just be a great opportunity for me to see it for the first time and but damn i don't know if i really knew what quite what i was in for yeah you know it's it's interesting because it, it it reminds me so this movie and another uh, example i can give that is just coming to my mind now like united 93 is another one that i think is a good movie fantastic i've watched it I, i've watched it once and i had no desire to watch it again because it was just so it was just so i mean the fact that united 93 used pretty much unknown actors and so it felt like you're watching real people experiencing that in real time uh it was just a lot and i, I appreciated it for i appreciated it for like the feelings it got out of me and how well it was done, but I was like, I can't see myself putting that on again. And so I, I felt the same way after watching this, even though I recommended it to a lot of people when I first saw it uh, 10 years ago. Right. Um, but, the, but with the <laughs> idea of like, I'm not going to watch it with you. Um, I, I, you know, I, well, I, you know, watch it on your own time. It's worth it. Um, but it was just hard. It's heavy. I mean, it's, I mean, it deals with a lot, of course, a lot of world, I mean, and especially at the time, two thousand nine, when like the real thing happened, the real event yes. happened. Um, I remember that. I remember it being covered on the news. Well, how but far away it is you really from Oakland? Uh, it's like six or seven hours. Okay, close enough. Uh, like some more. I didn't yes, know yeah, it was even a West Coast story. I 
like I had known the gist of what the story was before watching, but didn't really know like, you know, geographically where it covered other than, and it was in America, but then I saw it was Oakland, California. Yeah. You came right to mind. I was like, damn, I wonder like where you were amongst all this when it was going on. And I know that it spawned like real life backlash and riots and whatnot. So what can you tell me about what was going on then? Well, it's, it's crazy to think too. It's like, this is really like the precursor to like the black lives, like the black lives matter movement. Uh, and it's Definitely. rude to think that that if it feels like you know everyone thinks about George Floyd and all that, and that mm -hmm. was such a big event. But I, mean, I think because of when the George Floyd stuff happened, because of what else was going on in the world at the same time, all that was happening. Certainly, yeah. It, it feels so much more. You know, we think about that kind of really being the beginning of it, but it really wasn't. There were so many uh, incidents of just more people having their phones out and capturing. Uh, sort of mistreatment of yep. African-American people by the police. And I know that's, yep. it's a pretty touchy subject too. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are cops and, you know, we, we talk about movies like this and real life right. events like this in a very like diplomatic way. They're not, they're not very one, you know, they don't get aggressive one way or the other because they understand that it's Good. a very uh, nuanced discussion to have right. and situation to be in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I, it's weird to think that, you know, this is 2009 and I don't, I remember at the time thinking like, oh, is there a lot of this going on? But this really would be kind of almost the beginning of so much of this stuff being captured in a way right? Uh, that, uh, that allows it to, one, go viral and then not be able to uh, change the narrative because, you know, they, uh, you know, someone might be able to, whoever is involved might be able to lie, right? Either it's, you know, the victim or, you know, uh, in this case, the cops, like who, like who's telling the truth? Did so and so get aggressive, or did they get aggressive? But then right. you have a third now, a bunch of third parties now who are watching this and recording it, and right. that spread that spread so much, and then you know was sent to, like to news stations. They picked up on it, and you know the narrative that was being spun wasn't quite um, what was true. I mean, they were able to see you know right. uh, what kind of really happened, and. Um, and in so many ways, that stuff is good because it's like, you know, we talk about, I think we were talking about it with like, with a horror movie, like talk to me, where like everyone's always on their phones, they're recording everything. But in another way, this, this is a very good thing too, sometimes where, you know, it holds people accountable uh, for the things, for the things that they've done. Um, so it's a very, it was a very, you know, I, it's interesting, like being African American and like, you know, when this stuff happens, it doesn't feel entirely new. Uh, I, unfortunately, well, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and, and then to have what, what I respect about what Ryan Coogler did with this movie, it's, uh, it's presented in a very respectful way. I like that. Um, and I know we can get more into it, just like a just kind of cliff notes, how he doesn't really make, uh, Oscar Grant, like a saint. He's clearly, you know, a product yeah. of his environment and yep. has his own issues. Um, I think that was really important because like, I think it would have been really a false thing to present him as, you know, something he wasn't. And I think it was really good to present him in a way that's like, oh, you know, he he got in trouble. I mean, at the, in real life, he was on parole when he when this happened. Right. Uh, and and I think that's honest to do. I mean, he could have easily kind of sugarcoated his, you know, life a bit in that final 24 hours. And I'm glad that yep. he didn't. Um, but also showing that even though he had like some issues and you know based on like kind of how he grew up and the environment he was in um it shined through that he loved his mother despite you know how you know she she worked hard to raise him and like that was probably difficult yep. but you know he loved his mother had uh mad love for his daughter which we also uh saw a lot of that and dynamic was just crushing <laughs> yeah and despite a, a wandering eye which they kind of poked a little bit fun at in the beginning of the movie. He had a lot of love for his girlfriend too. I mean, even though that was a complicated relationship, so I I kind of like that. Which, which relationships aren't complicated, right? Like I oh couldn't exactly agree, couldn't agree more. Like the way that Ryan Coogler tackled the more genuine portrayal of his life. I'm sure some details, like some of the intimate details where nobody else is around. Like he has a couple one on one conversations, stuff like that. Details might be a little bit embellished for the sake of the movie. It's rare you'd find. Yeah you know, biopics that don't embellish stuff like that. But um, you're right. Totally fantastic move to not portray him as a saint. He, but that just makes him more grounded, more believable, more relatable for people that will. may uh, choose or find themselves relating to this sort of subject. And I think the movie is better off because of it. And I feel like it would be harder to really take seriously if 
there's no blips on this guy's character it just shows you that he's right, right. just like anybody else and uh yeah just yeah. It, it, made, it makes that gut punch at the end just so much more all the more yeah genuine yeah yeah exactly um for for people that don't know uh what the movie is about uh Fruitville station uh, was released on July 12, 2013, making it's just past its 10-year anniversary. Uh, written and directed by Ryan Coogler, it is Coogler's feature directorial debut and is based on the events leading to the death of Oscar Grant, a young man killed in 2009 by a Bay Area Rapid Transit police officer at the Fruitville District Station in Oakland. Uh, the film stars Michael B. Jordan as Grant, uh, with Kevin Durant and Chad Michael Murray as the two cops. Melanie Diaz as his girlfriend, and Octavia Spencer plays uh, his mother. This movie made a huge splash at the Sundance Film Festival and the Cannes Film Festival. And on a budget of $900,000, it was able to make $17.4 million worldwide. Ooh. So it did turn a profit. Um, off. And changed the lives of several people that were involved in the movie. I mean, most notably Ryan Coogler and Michael B. Jordan. Because I think Michael B. Jordan before this had already done, uh, I believe, Chronicle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he had done Chronicle already. Um, but And that awkward... Oh, no. no actually, no. no right Chronicle. After, and then, yeah. Right after, yeah. Uh, before this, uh, Michael B. Jordan was on the soap opera All My Children for three years. He also did The Wire. Yes. Um, so Love this was... Uh, yeah. So this was his big kind of uh breakout role that showed um how much range he had yeah. as an actor and you know melanie diaz who plays the girlfriend she also was popping up around this time in a lot of uh independent films that went to sundance she's in she's in this a guy to recognizing your saying she's really good to play in the girlfriend with a lot of sass i'm not saying that she's a typecast <laughs> she but she's good at it yeah she's really really good at it and um yeah, it, it was, um, I think, a very su surprising debut. I didn't know what to think when I first saw it. I read reviews on it uh, before it came out 10 years ago and um, didn't know I was going to be watching essentially what and I think that, but what makes it more powerful is just a day in the life of someone. And, and, like, it's so like, it's like so mundane and so like, yeah, nothing like, you know, like there are a few things that happen, but it really is just like what everyday situation could this particular person possibly get in 24 hours and you almost forget that you're leading up to what the final moments are going to be. And that's what makes the final moment. So until jarring. you hear the, the train conductor or whoever's on the loudspeaker say next stop for Vail station, then you just remember that first scene and what goes down, you know, this is what the whole movie has been building to. And I remember yeah. like, thinking, well, <laughs> not that it happened very long ago. I'm, fresh off the watch but just thinking like man like can't we just go a little bit more like i don't want to go to where we're headed I just wanted to see more of this character because you're right even though it's yeah. pretty mundane just a day in the life like he's still such a a larger than life character and you feel like pretty intimately involved in the yeah. details of his life even though you just see a day and yeah just really didn't want to part ways with with oscar grant by the end of the movie and yeah just i didn't want to get to that end i knew where it was headed um, yeah. What do you think about the idea or the, the decision to show the footage at the beginning of the movie? The um, I, you know, I, I read up on this. I, I heard that he didn't want Ryan Coogler didn't want to use it at first. Okay. Um, and I thought it was a good choice to kind of get you right into the, like, you know, what you need to see and feel, uh, to remind let you right. I mean, what the right. To see. Yeah. Right, and I think, and then he said that's why he ultimately chose to do it because he said, you know, being in that area, he knew the story already. But then he was like, okay, what if so many people don't? And what if they're, even though they know they're going to go see this and they they might hear it's based on a true story, like they need to really see something true first before they get into uh, this uh, kind of Hollywood narrative, not even Hollywood, but like you know. Right. not real version of it and you know he he didn't want to because like you know that video that video circulated a, a while a long time i think it was on i don't know if it's still on youtube it was circulating around there for a okay. while too on there um and he was like you know i've seen it a lot you know i and a lot of my friends a lot of people i know people in my life have seen it and i didn't want to really exploit it by showing it again but then he thought about so many people who like you know people at the sundown film festival maybe they haven't yeah. you know in that case yeah. or someone like you like you yeah, never like exactly. saw it um so and i he was like for that reason it worked in a pretty powerful way to pull you right into it and i think it was a good decision to i included at the beginning completely agree even though i knew what i was getting into that's just because i'd heard firsthand what the movie was about 
from my pal, but I think I was just, you know, putting myself in front of like maybe like an ignorant audience member who wouldn't have known necessarily yeah. what was going on. I'm like this, that's a great way to open it up and just sets the, well, I don't know if I want to say it sets the tone. I don't know if that's exactly the, the phrase I'm looking for. It does. It, it, rem- it very early on lets you know what sort of story you're getting into and kind of, I think it's a cautionary tale not to get too close to this character because we know what's going to happen. But um, cause the yeah. movie, like the so other, tones throughout the movie that aren't just dismal like how the, the movie opens up but i thought it was a fantastic uh directorial choice yeah and i thought it was really it also works in a way too when once you uh not to jump to the end but just to just talk about how seeing the real thing and then seeing how from the just the cell phone footage how mm. accurately they recreate that whole setup towards yep. the end uh mm-hmm. that makes it even more powerful that it's oh like they Every detail. I mean, there's if you read the real story about what people were saying, even in those moments that people heard them say, or they know, like friends that were telling cops, like, you know, later, like, this is what was said while we were sitting down. He used so much of that real life dialogue in those moments. So if you ever read up on the story and you yeah. hear, hear like familiar, like, oh, this was said and this was said, he used that in the movie because he wanted it to be as realistic as it felt possible. authentic. Like, don't like couldn't take the, yeah. any points away from that movie for feeling that way it uh felt like you were watching it happen it was yeah, yeah. very very impactful yeah um, i agree um well so i mean once you once it started and because i mean what did cam tell you anything about like how how the movie would kind of like run or did you know that you were just gonna watch like okay it's just a day in his life and and then we kind of just gradually get to uh that point towards the end yeah like i this was a conversation we'd had literally years ago because he'd been pretty removed from the watch as well, but it had just been one of those movies that had, you know, been on my list for a lot of years. And as much as I knew about it, which wasn't much, that is exactly, I got what I had known about it. So I knew that it was a, all I hadn't really known was it's a day in the life of uh, a, a black man in America who dies via police violence. And that's right. Pretty much cookie cutter what it is. So I didn't really know, there's no surprises, I guess we'll say, but uh, I hadn't, we hadn't really discussed the movie in any detail in a long time, but uh, that is pretty much all I had known about it. But uh, no surprises, but it also didn't really need to pull any punches or do anything. I think it did such a good job of just genuinely showing the ups and downs of Oscar's life and, and his, and his last yeah. day of his life. Yeah. And I try, I'm sure there have been other movies sort of like that. None had come to mind, but uh, it just didn't really, I don't think it really, uh, impact or none others no other movies like following this sort of format really came to mind or had touched me like this one really did but i'm trying to think yeah the only movies like that but uh any comes the only thing i can think of that i've seen uh off the top of my head there's this movie called elephant which is kind of loosely based on like the columbine columbine massacre and and gus van zandt directed it and really the movie and and that i like the movie but the complaint of it is the first hour and some change is really just following these kids through like a normal day. And there's okay. No, and then the big event doesn't really happen until towards the end. I mean, it, that, that's what it kind of reminded me of where, but I mean, I, I think of it this way, yeah. but I think of it this way. If you're depicting that actual event uh, for someone like Oscar, that would be a normal day. And that's what you would need to watch and see. It wouldn't yeah. be anything exceptional. And then in, in the case of elephant and you're just going to high school that day, that is what that day was. It's just a normal, like, I'm just going to school. And right. that's it. So I appreciate a realistic pro- approach like that because that's what the day would be like. You wouldn't expect any of this stuff to happen the, no. by the end, by the end <laughs> of your day. Like, I mean, right. I, it's, like, no one expects that to happen. So it's, uh, I appreciate that approach. I mean, and, and in the end, it's all about if the writing is good enough to sustain yes. watching someone uh, basically do nothing. Uh, are and is the acting and stuff good as well? And uh, in, in the case of this, Oscar, as played by Michael B. Board, Jordan, is interesting enough to watch for a good hour and some change before even the actual yeah. tragic event happened. And then also his interactions with his friends are interesting to watch. His interactions with his mom uh, in mm-hmm. present day, and even going back to when she visited him in jail. Uh, you know, you know, it's it, it's so. I thought that scene where she visited him is so Ooh. honest. We, because sometimes people like Oscar, instead of just admitting like, like, oh, like, you know, I'm in this predicament because of something I did. This is this is my fault. Right. Uh, they kind of play the blame game a little bit. 
Yep. And in that scene, you can see him doing that with her, like almost like, you know, he gets defensive. This, how is it? Yeah, this hard for you. Like, no, this is like, I'm here. I'm stuck here. You know, it's, yeah. but you're there because, you know, of something you did. Um, and then in the complete turnaround when she leaves, I just love when he goes from that, all that anger and being defensive to like apologizing to her and wanting to like, you know, have her not leave because right. like he, you know, he needs her there. Yeah. So, like, you know, at the end of the day, like, I mean, Oscar, Oscar Grant was 22 when he died. So, I mean, he was still not, a child by any means, but maybe you know. Well, well, a lot of people would argue that you're not a fully formed adult at 22. As a either. 25, year, <laughs> I would say certainly not. I was not at 22, yeah. and while you're totally right, he's by no means a child. Like I still feel like he's three years. He was three years younger than I am now, and I I feel that way about him. Like he had so much life to live. He was no, he was nothing. He was hardly an adult. It's just adds to that tragedy. Not that it wouldn't be any less tragic if he was 32 or 42. Um, yeah. But just the fact that he was so young is just horrible. And back to that moment of um, his mom leaving jail and he's just like yelling at her, like, come on, at least give me a hug before you go. Uh, before you go. That, to have that final scene where she's led to see his body and she's like, oh, man. A hug. I was like, man, you're just ripping so the heart out that, of there. So that, uh, oh. when I watched it uh, recently, that was the part that made me tear up. It was, and yeah, she was like crying with the. And then she was like, he doesn't like being alone. And I was like, oh, really? It was like everything that like she said. Uh, Octavia Spencer is so good. Uh, at very small part, but like so good. And not just in that big emotional scene, but I loved her trying to show strength in the hospital when like they're so yeah. hostile. But like, you know, and she's just like, let them do what they need to do. Like, it's going to be OK. Let the doctors do their work. She's trying so hard just to be strong in that moment for the rest right. of them, probably knowing that like, you know, Maybe things aren't going to be yeah. work out that way, but you know, at the end of the day, she's also a mom, and I like how I like how she like calms them down because they're so angry and rowdy, and she's like, "No, we're not going to do this right now. We're not going to do this here. Like everyone, stop it. You know, we have to like give all our strength to him." I, I thought just little small things like that that were written were so it's so real and so honest, and I, yeah, that's what I, I appreciated about it. I appreciated that uh, with a at the time this came out, twenty thirteen, Octavia Spencer's pretty big name and one of the producers of that movie like the biggest name in that movie for sure at the at the time and at the I time yeah the movie doesn't try to make it her show by any means she's very much relegated to a few scenes um not, doesn't try to be about her when she's in them she just does a great job for what the role that's written for her allows her to do and i thought it's very much yeah. michael b board michael b jordan's show and i really really yeah. like that great chance for him to shine yeah this is still i i mean he's done a lot of stuff since then of course but this is still I think the best thing he's put out as far as, as an actor. I mean, I guess I, so, yeah. I mean, I guess I guess I can like grab some moments from like some of the Creed movies and be like, oh, there's yeah. some good strong moments in that. But I, this is, I mean, I, I almost want to call it a debut, and it's not because he's done other stuff. But like this was, oh, I, I found myself <laughs> the same thing. I was like, wait, I because I was thinking I don't know him from anything before this, and I was like, I'm literally he's fantastic in season one of The Wire. He's like a teenager. At, in that, yeah. and, uh, I think he's great as Wallace in that show, but this is definitely next level. He's had a lot of time to develop as an actor in the yep. ten years since he, that he left that role behind. But it very much did feel like s somewhat of a debut, maybe more like uh, him leaving adolescence and into adulthood as an yeah, actor. adulthood. Like that sort yeah. of debut for him. And Ryan and Ryan Coogler wanted him. He had him in mind yeah. for the part. So like you know, that's do you have any idea well, about good, where like, their relationships? starts i'm wondering like how they met. i don't really know i uh i yeah you know, i can try to pull it up and uh, while we're talking about some other collaboration stuff. together for sure um but i was i found i read yeah. that too that he wrote that uh or like because i know i know it's a true story but right kugler still wrote it and i guess he wrote yeah, it, yeah. uh michael b jordan in mind i'm just curious where he would have Unless he was just familiar with his, yeah. just fan, a fan of his work uh at an early age and Perhaps. probably saw that he could play someone at like oscar uh i mean uh, I think what Michael B. Jordan's good at in this is there's an edge to him, but there's also you have this like there's also a little bit of vulnerability where you you feel for him, and he's he's also a likable yes, person too. Yeah, I actually right. th the scene in the market when he's talking to the girl about the fish fry, mm -hmm. which is again a nothing. I mean, I guess to, I guess I don't want to say it's nothing because I I might be overthinking it, but when I think it seems like that, this this movie has all this like what towards the end will look like kind of this like racial hostility a bit. Right. I, I kind of read those scenes and like that scene in the market as look at this kind of nice, 
uh, moment where these two very different people are able to communicate about something without it turning hostile. Like at first you think it might yeah. go that way when he's asking her too many questions or maybe she might be like, oh, who are you or right. whatever. And then he and then he gets his grandmother on the phone and like puts his grandmother on the phone with her so she can like get the right, you know, fish for a french fry. That's a wholesome thing to do. Yeah. So I, I kept thinking like maybe those that's there to show like, you know, this is this positive side of what an interaction can be between two very different people from two very different walks of life. And then of course later we have the opposite of that, where you have two very different people who, yeah. uh, groups that clash because perceived differences between them, and right. and then having that same girl be there too at towards in the end with all that, and right. see, I thought that was just uh, you know, and I think you also see that uh, uh, in the moment on when they're on the train where it's about to be New Year's, uh, the countdown's coming, and it seems like there might be some hostility on the train between some of the people, but then it turns into. He's like playing music on his phone, and then the guy reaches in his backpack, and you're like, "What's he reaching for?" And right. then it's just the speakers to like to play the music louder, and then it's this whole communal experience between right. all these people before again things go to hell um, right. rather than the movie. So I, you know, I just read that's my interpretation. Maybe I mean those that that stuff might have happened in real life too. I'm not sure, but like it just felt like that was a good thing to see that he was trying to show, you know, hey, these interactions between very different people can be positive yes to and then the, rather than the negative movie's full of those he has that uh, the same scene where he runs into that guy after they convince the store owner to let their girlfriends in to use the bathroom oh, yeah. speaking with that other gentleman outside and they you know have a, a pretty good conversation and strike it off and it's very friendly but yeah there's tons of instances like that in the movie and i think uh cougar i'm sure not all those interactions were legitimate but i think we're true yeah we're written for the movie like add very much to him as a character Right, and like even and like you mentioned that scene with uh with the guy out, outside the store while they're waiting for their uh, girlfriends to go use the restroom. It I like that moment too because he's like again two very different people interacting. But then I just remember I, I again when I was watching it for this, I was so caught up in like oh he's like he like do you want to get married? He's like oh, I basically I think so and like mm-hmm. ask you you know, and then like there's this moment of realization for yourself where you're like that's not gonna happen because it's like this is right. You're built. You're building to this, like, <sighs> like you're throwing, you're throwing all these like very nice things at us, and like making us like him, and like think about like what his future might be, and then, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, it's not the movie pulling the rug out of me; it's real life. But it's you know, it's ah, it's makes I, it difficult to watch. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about you on upon your rewatch, having seen it, know where it's headed. I I hadn't seen it, but still knew the conclusion, but. I was in denial about him actually dying. Like when they are, I didn't realize that he had made it to the hospital and went through surgery and all this sort of thing. So when they're showing yep. like them replacing the, the doing the blood transfusions and hooking him up with the tubes, I'm like, Oh, okay. Like there's a chance he'll, he'll pull through. Right. Like, this Oh, you forget. Yeah. You just, um, but I know forget. in the back of my head, he's not, but like, I just feel like that they're giving you a little bit of hope and uh, which just makes him all the more devastating when, when uh, his mom gets the news from the doctor that, you know, he didn't make it. Yeah. But, uh, you just really feel it's something f- peculiar, I guess, about the human spirit, about desperately clamoring for something you know won't happen. I don't know what it is, but movies have that effect. Yeah. And even though knowing it wouldn't go that way, like I just made it all the worse. Um, I actually found what you were looking for. So okay. they actually did meet for the first time doing this. He knew he wanted him to be in it and got uh, Ryan Coogler got into contact with him. And they actually met at a Starbucks to talk about uh, no the movie and the part and the role. Uh, and uh, they connected on how he connected with the character and he really wanted to do it with him. And you he had uh, a that. lot of cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, was like, like, I was like, I was like, I told like, no, I had to like, I was like, I wonder if I could find it. Uh, but yeah, they did. They actually did a podcast around the time that Creed three came out and they talked about how they first oh, met. Oh, cool. And, uh, and yeah, he he was saying that uh, he had a lot of confidence in Michael B. Jordan just based on the work he already saw. And after he right talked to him so. and they really uh, had a full understanding of what the project was going to be, he really he knew he really wanted him. And Michael B. Jordan really wanted to work with him at that point. And I wonder if you know weird. when you're an actor if that's going to be like you're like this is going to be like my thing that's going to really break me out. Are you only are you even think about it like that? I bet you you can probably recognize that this is an opportunity to at least if you, you know, put in a good performance and the movie d- does well, because I mean, just looking at that kind of role and especially it being a true life story, I'm sure like 
I would, you'd think that maybe they'd be aware that this could be the chance for the breakout, but yeah, I'd be, I'd be curious uh, as well to know what's going through an actor's head when they're going for that first kind of like leading chance to, to really break it on the scene. Yeah. yeah. But I was just gonna say, you're great at pulling shit up. Yeah, on the fly. You remind me of Jamie from Joe Rogan's podcast. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, sometimes I mean, I, full disclosure listeners, like sometimes we probably should have this stuff just ready, but like sometimes we don't know what we're going to ask each other. So exactly. it's like, all right, I'll like, I'll look it up real quick and see what well, I can I, find. And, and you're great. So- <laughs> at doing that, I, will, I can't finish a thought if I'm typing away. So I'll, I'll throw questions out there. Not even necessarily <laughs> expecting we're going to get to the answer because I know I would lose focus if I'm going through. So you, you're great at you know multitasking, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also love that they actually shot in Oakland, California. I think uh, yeah, keep it, keeping it in the real place was good. They were actually allowed. Uh, Bart allo- agreed to let them uh, shoot at Freeville Station for three four-hour nights, uh, and they said that most of the platform scenes were shot over the course of two nights, uh, with another night dedicated to the sequences on the train that led up to the police confrontation. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I guess I'm not surprised they let them shoot because they're probably like, hey, like, there might probably be a lot of bike collection we didn't let you shoot here because it's, you know, uh, yeah. you got to make it <laughs> kind of make it authentic <laughs> as possible. Agreed. Um, and, uh, but it does add, it adds a, story, a certain authenticity uh, knowing that it's in the the actual city and place uh, that this took place. So, yeah, I think that helps at, a lot. At, at risk of maybe um, jeopardizing a fact that you had saved up for the end, I, I, I was reading that um, like at, in the scene where they're portraying like the final confrontation, like Michael B. Jordan is right, his he's acting right over the the bullet still in the ground at the station, like yeah. where Oscar was killed, and like they're they're shooting the scene right over it, which I thought was like. Ve- <laughs> I'm I'm yeah. glad they shot like for authenticity's sake, but I can imagine that would add crazy gravity to the scene as they're filming it that couldn't have been uh easy oh that would be a crazy you know I mean? thing that that would be a crazy thing for me to disconnect as an actor i'd be like oh like you know because i, I mean I, if you're michael b jordan you're i mean i know this is just a part you're acting but this is a real person so at a certain point you're living his life you have to get as deep into it as you can so they're like it to make it easier honestly to connect yeah to connect Maybe. to it and you know, I always wonder what it's like when actors have have to shoot, particularly that stuff towards the end that they all had to shoot, because I I imagine it wasn't easy for any of them. They're all actors, and it's a job. But I mean, even if it, even if it's an elaborate game of make believe, that it's still a real event that happened, right? So it's a uh, it's a really has to be a real. I just wonder what it's like when they yell cut. And if it's like if there's like hey, okay, like, consoling each other. It's like oh, let me give you space. Like how I mean, yeah, that would be interesting what? to see like what the uh, actual like interactions are, because I, I can't imagine that stuff was easy to shoot like at all. One, you have to be trying to be as accurate as you can to like setting it up and staging it and all that. And then just, you know, it's in the case of like Michael B. Jordan and the actors who's playing his friends. Yeah, it's a movie, but like you're still portraying like African-American males who are being, uh, who they feel are being like wrongly accosted by the cops. Maybe like, they're like, "Hey, I didn't do anything." And and this is a really touchy subject too, because I've talked to a couple of friends who've seen the movie, and they meant no harm by some of the stuff. Some of the stuff they said, they weren't trying okay. to like be uh, disrespectful or anything. They were honestly because they were like they tried to read on the real story and they were watching the movie. They were like, "Well, if I'm just looking at the movie, like there was a fight, and some of them were like." involved like either directly or indirectly right and like you know and then instead of just you know maybe sticking around and seeing what happens they they try to like you know he hops they go one way and he hops in the train and just kind of like you know hopefully they won't like see me or do anything and of course that one cop goes on there and like in the real in the real story the way that's told it's they made it seem like the cop almost was like just because you look like you might have been involved, that is why I'm pulling you off the, that is certainly the how train. The portrayed. That's what I was thinking watching it. Yeah. So, I mean, I get there being hard because, you know, there is a lot of back and forth between them uh, where they're like, I didn't do anything wrong, I didn't do anything wrong. And, you know, right. you've, you, and you see that a lot in a lot of even the real, in other cases, like real cell phone video. If someone's capturing that, there is like sometimes a back and forth. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you pulling me over? Why are you stopping me? Right. Uh, I just kind of like combative uh, yeah. thing with cops. And I know that is a particularly like 
touchy subject for some people where it's like, well, if you're just compliant, nothing's going to happen. Um, that, of course, is easy for some people to say because, you know, yeah. they are not in, uh, they're they don't definitely not sort of issues yeah. at all. But yeah, when I, was, when I was watching it for this, I was like trying to look at it in a way where I was like, oh, is there, if, was there a way, not, not, none of this is justified at all, but I was like, was there an, any moment where it's like, oh, maybe if they had done this, like, it would have been a bit different. Mm-hmm. But it also seems like the cops were really, uh, the one in particular, the one that stops them first, was just extremely hostile. Aggressive, hostile, uh, yeah. And ag- aggressive. It feels like yeah. they're walking onto the scene with a bone to pick right from the get-go. And while it's definitely true that the the group, like Oscar and his friends, if, certainly if they maybe hadn't have been so combative and, and mouthy, could things have gone a different way? Certainly, but that is not removed from the cop's demeanor as it's portrayed in the movie, which I'm sure is similar to how it went yeah. down in real life. I just don't have any context to that, but you, you can tell they're almost looking for a fight when they come on there. And it, it, feels yeah. like it was just a perfect storm. No party is really being cooperative or they at least sort of have an outcome in mind by the time they get there. And, uh, the, the action well, there is one, a, w- the one way, the way that one friend talks to the female cop, I was like, all right, well that's, uh, like basically almost called it like sweetheart some of that along those lines are like right. talks in a kind of a derogatory way and i was like well that's not i mean of course none of it it should have escalated to where it got but it was like you know uh i do think the movie does a good job of like making you be like okay well there maybe there could have been a moment where either party could have like settled this a little bit you know at some point right. um and I think it's it's also it's a testament of how well uh Michael B. Jordan plays that whole scene where he goes from being like we didn't do anything. We do anything. We just want to go. And then he transitions to like calming his friends down. Like we're gonna get out of here. We're gonna go home. Just yeah, it's fine. Stay calm. He go. Yeah. He goes back and forth. And then and then I think that one point where he gets up, where he thinks he can like convince him, like, hey, like we didn't do anything wrong. We can just go. We we want to leave. And then it becomes. I mean, I think he, I think the cop hits him like after oh, that. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's like clear that that's not you know, and, and that, that only makes the rest of the group. The rest of the group gets upset, but yeah, I love how Michael B. Jordan plays it. He just bounces from like one emotion to the next, of because I think that's how, you, well, how you would might feel if you were like, all right, I'm angry, but I also don't want to go back. He doesn't want to go back to jail. I mean, he, there's a lot of stuff probably sure going he, through his mind. He, I feel like, yeah, with, to sum it up, like I feel like he was portrayed it as it like panicky, and you would be flipping back and forth, yeah. and trying to reason with them and trying to keep your buddies calm and not have things escalate, yeah. and also trying to defend your honor and your pride and try and prevent what you think might happen from happening. So I think, he's yeah. bou- like you said, he's bouncing between those three or four different emotions because he's probably panicked and terrified that this might, you know, go the way that it does. And you're right. He was yeah. phenomenal at, I'm sure to an extent it, it felt very much real. Like just, you know, Michael B. Jordan being who he is, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd face something like that maybe before or something I- he can at least intimately relate to. And uh, yeah. yeah, it came across in his performance for sure. Yeah. And, um, I the, the stat scene plays out almost if you were to read how like this is laid out. If you were to read an article about it, like, and if it was describe, describing how, even? yeah, 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 describing how like just the way in which like they're sitting there, the way the cops are like like kind of over them. Like even when he when he hit him the first, he hit him twice. Like hit him the first time, I was like, I just remember going back to like reading like this is exactly how this kind of happened now there is the mm. big bone of contention where, where he says the whole bitch ass n-word thing right. like re- reading this reading it uh in real life the someone said they heard just the cops say that to him and then the cops said that well i basically mouthed back what he said to me which is kind of what the the movie kind of alludes yeah, yeah, yeah. to um but again i think what the movie does a really good job of is that you know he he says it Oscar says it, and then the cop says it again to him, and then he's like, right. basically, oh, you can't say that. And I think what makes it worse is the second one from the cop after he says, you can't say that, and he just basically leans in on him and says it Double right down. to his face. Yeah. Uh, doubles down on it. So even if even if there is a bone of contention about how that was said, I think I and I don't know if that was just a choice, but that is, I thought that was a good choice being like, well, I mean, could have gone that way too, and that way is also pretty bad right. as well. Uh, to you know, to lay that out there, but yeah, I mean, even the way that they pin him down and like put his try trying to get his arm behind his back, like mm-hmm. watching it, you feel like you're reading. I, I felt like I was like reading. It was so well uh, recreated, basically. 
uh, by Ryan Coogler and everyone. Certainly. And it feels like something that just like in the age of social media, like, I don't know about you, I've seen more or less very similar instances, maybe ones that didn't progress to the, the one that this story did, but you feel like you've seen this a yeah. hundred times on the internet of thing, situations going exactly like this. And you're right. It looked like an exact replica of something you might experience anywhere really yeah. in, in the States where that is, you know, an issue. Yeah, is like for sure. It leaves a terrible taste in your mouth. Honestly, it's despicable. Yeah. And uh, uh, even that line where he's like, you shot me. I have a daughter. He apparently oh, he really said that. Like he oh, really said no, that twice, I guess. That, to the cop. Yeah. And uh, so and then doing that, like it made me even more like, oh, fuck, that's I mean, I mean, you could easily write a line like that to like pull at the hard strings. But like to know that, like, to, he yeah. really said that. That's, that was the first thing he thought about was his right. daughter and and uh, yeah because yeah. I in the I apparently it, they, it sh- he got shot in the back and it went straight through ricocheted off the concrete and then punctured his his lung uh, okay and uh, which I mean they talk about in the movie where they said he was in surgery and they were like they had to remove and they were like his lung and she's like yeah. well how do you yeah that whole scene is uh, um back to the component of. I think the relationship with his daughter is definitely the core of that movie, I would say. And she, the the actress, I'm trying to access it real quick, but I, I couldn't remember the name of the, the young girl that plays his daughter who couldn't have been six or seven at the time. She was a fantastic child actress, some of the, the best I'd seen, and just like adorable relationship they had, which, again, knowing where the movie yeah. goes is make it all the more tragic, but I really enjoyed her performance. She was great. I too. I thought that she... Uh... Well, one, I guess it, that that relationship humanizes him more than any relationship in the movie. Uh, even though he does have a good relationship with you know other people in the film, like this is you you imagine that he could get the parts of his his life that he can't quite get right, he'll eventually get them right for her. And that was like the kind of vibe I got yes. like watching their watching their scenes together. Um, that's the one th- person he would want to work really hard for. Yeah. Uh, and Ari- try to change his life for Ariana Neal. Which I thought was, was the, the actress's name. Okay, there we go. Yeah, yep, that played the daughter. Yeah, yeah, and oh, uh, that in that scene uh, at the end when like the uh, girlfriend gets home and daughter's basically, you know, she has to tell her. I mean, when you're alluding to like telling her and like, oh, and yeah. it's just. Oh, uh, that whole yeah. I was wondering what what the final sequence is going to be. Um, like I knew we. This is just kind of the story that's destined to end with you know the text on screen showing a little bit of the yeah yeah. There's like no way like else to right. But before they cut to black, I'm like, well, how are they going to end this? And I thought that was again like it's not the scene where like it really got to me the most, but it was I think one of the more impactful moments of the film is when the final scene is you know mom or the the daughter asking. Her mom, where daddy's, and you can tell she just doesn't know how to answer. And it's like, As, yeah, oh, what a fucking note to leave that movie, yeah, on, man. But I couldn't I imagine it any other way, yeah, that's true. And I, another thing, too, like the movie's not long, this is like 85 minutes, uh, yeah. and th- that's a and actually, that's perfect. long enough, uh, yeah, it's perfect certainly. amount of time for something like this. Um, I was surpri- surprised the first time I saw it how much a little longer it goes post the shooting i i didn't yeah. i thought that maybe the movie would cut maybe after that and kind of do, do the do the title card stuff at the end and all that um the fact that it lingered a bit longer and it did took you to you know the the, the emergency room and like those scenes are because they're just as strong as some of this uh of some of those indie moments too i think you really needed that and of course you get that you know big moment with octavia spencer when she sees his body and all that and uh she has that kind of breakdown but yeah i was surprised that there was like so much not a lot more movie, but you know, a decent amount left. More than uh, I anticipated certainly for after sure. the after after the shooting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I thought it was good to have that, and it didn't really feel tacked on. Like sometimes stuff like that could feel like oh, like they're just kind of padding the runtime and like pushing it along. Right. Um, but I, but like I think you needed eighty five minutes. So <laughs> yeah, I know. I think you need. I think you needed, and it sounds so bad, but I think you needed for maybe audience members that didn't know about it to show what maybe a moment of hope would look like for the mom in that case, in that situation, like being strong for everyone in that situation and uh, not, not condemning anyone. At the now, now later, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure when all this like went to court and everything, I mean, I'm sure she was 
a force to be reckoned with. But that kind of moment uh, in the hospital where she knew she had to just be strong for a second, I think that was important to see uh, rather than not showing it at all. Um, I mean, it, it just added another fucking element to like make you tear up, but it, it works. <laughs> yeah. Works, works, works. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, and you know what's interesting? Much like the first time I watched it, I, I, I've never watched this movie with anyone. Uh, oh, okay. I've 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 only watched it by myself, and I've had friends that wanted to watch it with me. I just like it's not a uh, it's not that kind of movie. You know, it's very intimate and personal, and not something that you'd really want to sit down and like necessarily share with with somebody. Unless I mean, I'm sure there there could be reasons, but I agree. I this would have been something I'm sure that Cam and I may have thrown on one day. But I'm kind of glad I got to experience it the way that I did, which was just by myself in my room because I really got to feel yeah. the full weight of that story just being by myself because like true life stories are like i mean i saw and it's a different kind of tragic story but i saw when alpha dog came out i saw that with a friend and that that real life story was a big one near and around uh different parts of la and okay, parts of california title rings a bell but i'm not familiar with that movie um it's uh so it's justin timberlake's in it emile hirsch uh anton yelshin was in it as well no and way, uh r.i.p ben Ben Foster. Uh, it's hey, that's a hell basically of a past, first of all. Oh, Bruce, yeah, Bruce Willis and Sharon Stone are in it. Like it's a, How it's do a. I know about this. What, what is it? It's movie? such a good movie. So it's based on a true story about this. They, all these like young kids, like nineteen, like maybe eighteen, nineteen, twenty. They are kind of led by this one guy who's a drug dealer, and they kind of all kind of hang out together, and they basically think they're kind of young thugs. They're all white, and they all think that they're hard and all that. Right. This one, one guy old. One guy owes him, I think it's fifteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars. It's really low drug right. debt compared to like what happens. And the brother doesn't pay it back. They get into an altercation, and uh, uh, the the brother has a younger brother who just wants to like kind of live his life, and he's fifteen years old. And in that kind of space of like parents will let him do anything, and he wants to. He re really idolizes his older brother too. Um, he gets into a fight with his parents. He runs. Uh, he sneaks out the house, and when he sneaks out the house, the guys who are owed the drug debt find him and kidnap him okay. and and essentially what they do is he's kidnapped but they have him hanging around all their friends and they give him this kind of false sense of like no like we're just kind of holding you till we figure out what to do about your brother and the movie actually counts down on the bottom of the screen because in real life there are maybe 30 plus witnesses that saw that kid with all of them okay. and no one did anything because they were like oh it looked like he was having fun and and he does look like he's having fun. He's 15. He's hanging out with older kids and they're drinking First and they're time smoking ever, probably, and Yeah. Yeah. And they're smoking weed and like all this other stuff. And one of the guys contacts their lawyer and they're like, well, what can happen if you hold someone for ransom? And they tell him like, oh, you can get this much time in prison. So their alternative is to then kill the kid, which is what, you know, transpires in real life as well. And it's a tough watch. I mean, like, but in the same way that this, I mean, this is different because there's a whole other element to the tragedy in Fruitvale Station. Yeah. Uh, Alpha, Alpha Dog was tragic because like this is his young kid that had no idea what he was getting into at all, and trust it. And you know, it's a it's a matter of days when he trusted these people. He actually thought they were becoming friends, and like that's right. you know kind of what happens when you're young and naive and hanging out with older people. You're cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, true life stories are like that. I mean, I watched that with a friend, but yeah, I have, I've had so many people. Because uh, one, it's. They love Ryan Cooler's work now, and they're like, "Oh, I want, I would want to watch that. Like, would you want to watch it?" And it's just not a kind of like, let's like kick it and watch it together. I mean, I can watch hard movies, I guess, with people. Yeah. But sometimes sure. a, a movie, sometimes that, like you said, it's better by myself, like to kind of let that I, all soak in. Movies that have, and I'm obviously many movies have an emotional core, but the movies that are like at its foundation are meant to be telling an emotional story i find are best enjoyed alone for you to f just fully be able to experience it the way that you want just unbiased and not wondering or trying to keep up appearances for any other people you might be watching it with and like i think that's probably a reason why i enjoyed not enjoyed i would have enjoyed the movie regardless but i guess why i, I guess felt so connected or like impacted by the movie as i did because uh, I, right. I definitely have it's kind of like i definitely have movies that i 
find fantastic that I would love to watch or put people on, but I just like to save her by myself. Like 12 years of slave is a, it's another one that comes to mind. I don't think I've ever watched hard, that with anybody another else. hard one too. I wouldn't watch that with anyone. Either. Yeah. One it's of my a hard one all too. time favorites, like top 10 for sure. And I like to just savor that movie and I'll watch it by myself whenever I'm feeling like it. This would be probably one of those, but maybe less often because it's again, just a gut punch. Yeah, I'm glad you agree with the whole. I mean, and this is not a detriment to the movie. This is just how powerful the movie is, and how realistic, and how you feel sure. after it's over. It's over. You know, a lot of people, you know, when it comes to movies, movies are an escape, right? It's, a, it's escapism entertainment. But then yeah. sometimes you get something like this, and you're like, I still want to see it because I want to know how they, how well it's made. Like what the direct, what directing choices they make, the acting choices, writing choices. How do yeah. they pull off really? Uh, doing the right thing with this kind of story too, like presenting it in the best way possible. But yeah, it's, it's hard. We tell people that movies are for an escape and then you're like, and then you watch something like this and it's <laughs> so, and, and it's so rooted in what's going on now. I know. Like, it, you know, that, I that's mean, that's so like the now. crazy part, like, you know, reading, like looking at it back, like this is 2009 when that actually happened. And, and uh, I mean, argument that it hasn't really gotten that much better it's worse, I mean, it's even. gotten worse <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like or maybe um, we're just seeing it more maybe it's the same and we're seeing like, it like you said it's like it's one of those two things um i mean i, I do want to ask you uh how did i mean my experience watching it might be different from yours Certainly. um you know like what so what did you like emotionally like what did you kind of pull from it and then, like what were you thinking like what it would be like for like an african-american male to be in this kind of position uh in that position as well which is kind of a difficult uh maybe a difficult thing to like maybe empathize with but i mean you're still human and like you know well, I'm sure no problem yeah. yeah um certainly nothing I, something i can only Im imagine to in any sort of way try to relate to it's something that i would just not just by nature of you know being white i, I can't yeah. put myself in his shoes um but i feel like this movie at least did the best job it possibly could have done to make me feel like I, no, it's not even really what I want to, how do I want to word it? I, I had no trouble getting behind, you know, the tragedy, the story, just by the nature of the story that was being told. Um, yeah. I don't even really, I don't, I don't know how to answer, I guess exactly. No, um, no, I get, no, I get you. I don't, I understand what you're trying to say. Yeah, I, guess. I suppose not. It's, it's like, it's not something I could relate to just by nature of how different, you know, um, Oscar and I are, but it's something that very intimately aware of the issue. And I feel like the movie did a fantastic job at relaying that issue without even, I know it is a social commentary in a way, but the movie, at, I would say, at least for me, in my experience, at no point did it come across like it was trying to be that way. It was just authentically telling a story that happened to be, yeah, you know, well, definitely true. And in a way the movie, but in nature of it telling the story becomes kind of like the social commentary but it doesn't feel like right. it's trying to do that. So, I don't Yeah, know I'm glad that there wasn't much. like a... No, it did. It totally did. I'm glad that there wasn't like a this is the message kind of It just didn't really moment have to be. It, it, movie it has to be. Yeah, it's right, right, right. And it's it's so authentically true that you... It, it doesn't even need to be that way. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I also like think it's important, like I said, to show the early parts of Oscar's day to kind of show... Right. Who he is and kind of what life he like, like even even the scene where he like I, I it's like little moments that showed his empathy as a person, like the whole situation with the dog, oh, and yeah. uh, I thought that and was like that was happening, but that was nothing compared yeah, to the ghost. I know to what's coming next, right? But <laughs> yeah. it it might feel like such a throwaway thing, but it kind of shows his character to you and like his again uh, his willingness to help but also i'm like i said i'm glad it didn't make him a perfect person either but right. you can be completely you can be completely imperfect and still have very good qualities about yourself as well so that's very much true of anyone that right. you know i mean i think we've all come across someone that's like oh god you're, you're always fucking up but like there's something good in them that's like oh they've they do that one thing they're like all right this is why i know you this is why we're friends or like whatever it is um, I would say there are several think, moments, but that that is the dog scene in particular is one that really humanized him. Right, really did, and uh, and of course all the stuff with his daughter, and I you know I even liked the really fun combative stuff with his girlfriend because like I even though it's like it was awesome, yeah. it was no it was really good because yeah he he 
clearly fucked around and like like how you try to say it was like one time and she was like no i'm not stupid you got caught um, one time that's right yeah you got caught one time but like you know even through all that hostile dialogue you can tell they love each other yeah uh and that's especially true once you're watching them late in the later part of the night when they're together uh heading out and mm-hmm. uh on the town together uh i think that was important to see too i thought they had really good chemistry uh, because it's not like they have like a ton of it's you know it's such a short movie and they don't really have like a ton of time to really build on that so you really have it has to be really quick and they did a really good job I mean I actually loved her stuff where in, of course he's you know tied up with the cops and she's down there and she can't really she doesn't know what's going on and she's just trying to figure out what's happening and she's calling his mom and talking mm-hmm. to her about like I don't know what's going on like the cops have him like and then of course they, they hear the shot. And then she's on the phone with her, and she's like, "I don't know what's happening. I know what's, what's going on. I but I heard something. I thought all that was so didn't even feel like written dialogue. It just felt like she was just kind of improving what she needed to say in that moment. It really felt real, absolutely. And when she tries to go up there, they kind of like she's like, "Why won't you let me go up there? Like, why won't you let me see him? Like, it, I just thought that was really she did a really good job. Melanie Diaz, her name, she was yes. amazing. She and it, favorite yeah. character of the movie was her presence when she was on i loved them going off together like they uh they you're right just back to what you said they did have fantastic chemistry yeah it was really like a very honest relationship and you know some because some are like that uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think we've all seen them <laughs> but yeah, yeah they had a really they had a, they had a really good uh dynamic and um also i just uh the i like the way the film looked it was shot on six uh, super 16 millimeter film and I, it just it kind of gives it a certain grittiness that doesn't look too mm. polished um it, i mean it almost like you're watching like it's so weird because they have that footage the cell phone footage at the beginning and i'm not saying that the look of the film looks that like uh cheap or whatever but it almost has this it's almost in the same dna of feeling that way almost like you're watching it's a good, documentary yeah. rather than watching yeah. a movie and i i think that was a good choice to to always make it feel like it was, this is a, yeah, it's a film, but you need to feel how real it is while you're watching it. And I, I think Ryan Coogler, uh, accomplished that. Uh, I completely agree. I mean, what a debut for him. I mean, that's, uh, I I mean, like, to like come out of the gate like that and to come out of the gate like that. And he's done pretty well since, I mean, uh, right away. I mean, he did really well. Post this yeah. movie, did Creed uh, you know, two I, years later, and then Black Panther right after that. Panther, uh, um, and uh, yeah, just like a crazy, really good, you know, film school talent. I mean, this is someone that really yes. studied it, and like you could tell that he did, but like not with it being too like you know, you know, for some film students are like really artsy fartsy with like and their this approach and stuff. Very much not. <laughs> no, not it doesn't not, feel right. Art. Artistic, you know there's I mean? there's no like there's no like random visual floor just in there just like make you feel something more like everything is so like this is just how it happens i and will say i would love for kugler to kind of come back to this sort of filmmaking this kind of movie hollywood studio mega pictures like he has been doing the last few years because i thought right. it was fantastic kind of working with this sort of project i agree with you because I, I i understand the uh especially when you're an, uh, an African American filmmaker to take those like if they even get offered a big studio movie to take it, yes, and because who stories knows that he when you might in those movies were yeah. great for him to tell, right? But yeah, I would love to see him do something. It just reminds me of like talking to uh, Owen. We were talking about Better Luck Tomorrow. Like, like that was Justin Lin, and Justin Lin since then, I mean, he became Mister Fast and the Furious, and like right. then, you know he's. His movies are all so huge, but like you go back to that one, it's like, oh, he can make something really small for no money, right? Make it look good for no money and have it be intimate and have a real authentic story. And you want that for like, you're like, hey, like this is kind of what put you on the map. Like, do that that. again, do that again. But I, but I also, I understand the desire to do bigger movies if they, if they're given to you, right? But you know, I, I want you to lose your artistic. I mean, I guess in Kugler's case, he didn't really lose his artistic integrity because, like, he still put a lot of it into Creed. He put a lot of it into Black Panther, and you know, it was uh, you know Wakanda Forever. It being a difficult shoot just because of the Chadwick Boseman stuff. I'm sure he put a lot of his heart and soul into that. I don't want to say that he didn't, but you know, there you know there is a clear difference between like a big studio film and something like 
Fruitvale Station. Well, certainly, especially <laughs> coming down to like he didn't write those other ones, and there's a lot more hands and cooks in the kitchen on big properties like you know the Marvel stuff, and even with uh, the Creed movies, where although it's somewhat of a more original tale, it's already part of a very established universe with the with the Rocky right. movies. So definitely less hands on for the guy behind the camera. So I would yeah think that it was great with as much I mean, the yeah. more creative freedom to the director the better and i feel like this is the the way to do it but i'm happy that you know yep. it almost feels like the natural trajectory of in hollywood is to start with a little indie project have it do well have a studio yeah. hand do a bigger movie and then so on and so forth but i don't know i liked him doing this i did too Oh, how'd you feel about the Weinstein Company logo popping up on the screen? I was like, this kind of dates. The- yeah, <laughs> I was like, this. Right, I, 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 yeah. I totally forgot. I was like, Oop. <laughs> well, yeah. What I gleaned from that, because like anytime I see the Weinstein, like obviously my initial thought is, okay, you gross. Like, and then I always think about how far we've come since all that. But my main yeah. takeaway this time was, I was impressed for Ryan Coogler because you know this uh, was bought by the Weinstein's just a few days after it premiered at Sundance. So. To yeah. see those names, I mean, regardless of what happened with you know who and that that company at the time before this was a thing, that that would have been a massive accolade for that. Movie. Yeah, so I mean, it was impressive that it caught their attention. That, yeah, we, I mean, I even hate to do this. We hate to give them c- credit because of especially the one who's not yeah. shall not be named. Exactly. Uh, but I mean, they were. The, I mean, back before even the Weinstein company, there was Miramax, and that that was the they were the granddaddies of the oscars for like a lot of years i mean that's right good well good will hunting shakespeare in love talented mr ripley they had like a ton of movies that were very good i mean they knew which movies to put their weight behind some i, I think some of them they probably bullied their way into but that's another story right. but i mean i guess think of the one upside like you said is that this is at sundance and they put their money into it and got it and i guess you have to look at the positive or like you know you know, I mean, 20, yeah. 2013, 2012, 2013, I don't, I mean, of course, people knew, as we know now, people knew right. about that stuff, but the we public, as a public right. didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a much different, much different beast I back then. I at, at it in that context and just what it would have meant for, you know, the people attached to the project. But yeah, you know, just, I mean, that's nothing, nothing new to us now being years after that. But yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting too uh, that they also did not shy away with how they were going to promote the movie because there was also a lot of stuff going on in real life around the time that the movie came out. Yeah, how did they uh, promote it? Because I'm 11. So when it's, the movie comes, or no, sorry, I'm 15. So they, uh, the Weinstein Company commissioned three murals to be painted in Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco by street artists Juan English, Lydia Emily, and anticipators of the film. And then some people questioned having a poster for the film Fruitville Station uh, in the BART, like uh, located where uh, to promote it there. Um, and they said there was no debate whether they'll allow Fruitville Station advertisements on BART, none whatsoever. We really support Ryan. He's just an amazing person. I think that Ryan had said it was his intention to show his love for Oakland and the people of Oakland, and he really succeeded. Um, they also said promotional material used on the film's Facebook page and website refer to the controversial killing of Trayvon Martin in Florida, which was mm. in the news at the same time as the film's release. That this was drew that some criticism. Holy. Yeah, that that, it's crazy. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they said this drew some criticism with publicist Angie Meyer stating it's absolutely inappropriate and morally wrong to use a high profile case to create public publicity and buzz around a movie release. Um, and as part of the film's promotion, the YC company set up the I am blank campaign to encourage people to share their stories of overcoming acts of social injustice or mistreatment and to upload photos or other artworks related to those experiences. I don't think in this case that using tying it to that case is bad publicity because it's, it's just, I think it just shows that like, Hey, this event took place in 2009. Here we are in 2013. There's something similar happening in right. real life. It, I don't think this was in a way to like, you know, maliciously sell tickets or to I get people didn't. to go see it. No, I think that is just a genuine like, hey, like this is still real. This is still happening. Here is a current event right now while we're promoting this movie that's taking place that shows that this is just as real now as it was then. So I I don't really agree with that being inappropriate. I all, I, I agree with you, and I I like that aspect of the encouragement to share your story of however you worded it, I thought was very good. 
but uh, yeah. share your experiences online with that. Uh, was it a hashtag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that uh, that's a great include. I was ignorant to that, but I think that is uh, that adds to. I think that's a great marketing. I don't want to call it yeah, tactics so. because that makes it sound. No, it sounds like it's more business. But... It's, it almost sounds like it's more businessy, but I think it was. I think that probably came from a really good place. I don't think that came that's from a I'm, place of yeah, trying to get at. I agree. Yeah, selling the movie in a really uh, inappropriate way. I think that's. I feel that's like just this, the right thing to do. They're more campaign or like marketing the story more than the movie as a product. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, I don't know. You have any other thoughts on the movie that you want to throw in before we throw in some facts? Um, nothing that I hadn't said already. Just uh, <laughs> I would say be weary anybody that is thinking of of watching, and just uh, I would say it'd be good to have a heads up, just as at, especially if you're somebody who might be able to relate to Oscar Grant. Just go in knowing what you're getting into. It's very impactful, um, emotional story as one might think just by knowing what it's about. But uh, fantastic watch. I would recommend to anybody that hasn't seen it yet is fans of, although it's very different from Ryan Coogler's work since, but I'd say this is more for uh, Michael B. Jordan fans perhaps to see a, an earlier role for him. But I, no, I couldn't recommend it enough. I, I rated it an yeah. eight on IMDb, just maybe by nature of how like kind of minuscule the movie is, and it doesn't yeah. wow like from a filmmaking standpoint. But my enjoyment for the movie would be higher than that. Yeah, that's interesting too. I, that's a good point because it there's not there's not a lot of flair going right. on here. This is more of like a need that though, right? All like so this is just the writing and the acting. I always wonder like. That's an interesting thing to think about how you rate something where, you know, hey, this is just kind of like a bare bones story and this right. is what it is. Um, and also, we always give our, I would give it probably give it 8.5. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's so weird to say I could give a movie an 8.5. Like, I probably, it'll be a long time before I watch it again. I can't even think of a time in a way unless when it turns 20, maybe <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will watch it again. And it feels so bad saying, cause it is such a really good debut from Brian. Cooper. Like it is worth seeing. And I'm not, I don't like either one of us are saying you shouldn't see it. It's a really great right. movie. Um, it's, it's just, uh, it's heavy. It's a hard watch. Yeah. And um, I, I felt a little, even knowing that I felt that way the first time I felt a little despondent after watching it the second time. Right. Uh, even knowing I had to do it, I mean, I could have easily discouraged you from picking. I could be like, no, nah, man, it's a little heavy. I don't want to do it. Um, but I was also like happy that you wanted to do it because it was such okay. a good. Well, I'm glad. At least, at least it was a least obvious pick amongst the uh, ones from July. Right. And I, I kind of, I, I don't know if you had mentioned to me that Cam had brought that movie up to you before. I doubt uh, it. when we I talked. Don't think so. Uh, but... So like, I didn't even know like it would be on like your uh, radar. Yeah, but like, I think it was. Yeah, so I, but it's a good one to definitely have seen, even if it's not one to really pop in on multiple <laughs> yeah, occasions. Yeah, certainly, but I feel like I, I'm glad to have experienced it and to add that to my catalog f for when I'm going to be recommending or thinking about movies that would tackle this sort of subject. I'm glad that I'll have this movie now as an experience, having watched it to think about, reflect upon, <clears throat> and maybe recommend in the future to, to people. Because, like, when I look at movies, I like my favorite way of recommending a movie is when somebody is like approaching it from an artistic way or almost like, like school, like if they're doing work or a project and they're looking for movies to at, if they're looking at a singular subject and want movies that would tackle or reflect whatever the subject is rather than yeah. just to recommend a movie for mindless entertainment. Like so many people are looking for recommendations for. So yeah. this would be a movie yeah. that I would keep in mind for somebody looking for a good story about race relations in the United States or um, police violence or just the African-American experience. Like this would be a movie that I yeah. would instantly point people towards. And so I'm glad that I can now make that recommendation because it is a fantastic yeah. film. Yeah. There's um, a lot of things you can kind of point to, to if people were interested in watching it uh, to really, if you had a friend that it, maybe, maybe you have a friend that really can't quite grasp seeing what they see on the news. There you go. And, and that's like, you know, maybe this might be the best thing to show someone because it is so real when it needs to be, but it's authentic and in, authentic in the way that it presents the lead character where, yeah, I think when you see these kind of things in the news sometimes and you're not attached to it and you've, and you're not someone that would personally go to it through it. Right. You're automatically thinking like, 
well, what did that person do? Or like, how did they end up in that situation? Like, you know, you don't think about them being human sometimes, I think. You automatically, like, you go to, like, what did they do wrong? Um, and that's, and I think with watching something like this, you would see, uh, you know, this is just a normal person that, you know, thrusts into a very uh, impossible situation that just escalates. And as these things sometimes do, and I think that it would be a good thing to show someone that's like, you know, I don't quite understand it, but I want to understand it. And I think that would be a good to movie to summarize show them for what that. you just said. Like, I feel like this movie would have the capacity to enlighten people who were ignorant about this particular issue. And I think it does that in, in a really great way. I would have trouble imagining somebody watching this and not being able to kind of, you know, just kind of get it afterwards. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and even if that's not the reason you're watching it, if you really, if you're just a fan of films and, some of the uh, just actors, directors, if you want to see what made Michael B. Jordan break out and become who he is now, and then Ryan Coogler as a director, this is a, you know, of course, a good it. place to start. Definitely. I mean, this is, I mean, I, may, I mentioned it earlier, I, I, I still think it's Michael B. Jordan's best performance. If Because uh, I have some, I actually know some people that like question his abilities sometimes. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, like there yeah, are some okay. people that didn't love him in Black Panther. They're like, oh, I thought he was like kind of overacting. And, uh, and, <laughs> I remember <laughs> people saying, like, when he came out, that Killmonger was the best MCU villain at the time. You villain, yeah, and right. I said, no way. I think he's fantastic. Does a great job. By no means, I think yeah. it was that. But never would I question his ability. I think Michael B. Jordan is a very talented actor. But I get maybe yeah, I think... where people were coming from with that, if that was something you heard. But that, I don't know. Yeah. Like, other than that, and no, his his acting ability, I don't think, deserves any question questioning. Not at all. Not at all whatsoever. Well, uh, just throw out some facts uh, for you guys. Uh, when the film opened, it made one hundred twenty-seven thousand oh, dollars, over one hundred twenty-seven thousand dollars in its first day, uh, and it ended up uh, making three hundred seven three hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars from seven theaters uh, for a fifty-three thousand eight hundred ninety-eight per theater average. It was the third highest opening of the year for a film in limited release, behind *Spring Breakers* and *The Place Beyond the Pines*. Uh, and it was one of the best op- and one of the best openings for a Sundance f- uh, Festival top prize winner. Uh, and then uh, eventually they uh, they could they opened it a little wide in 1,000 locations uh, at its widest. That was on July 26. Uh, it earned 4.5 million dollars in that weekend, and eventually grew 16.1 million dollars domestic, and then another 1.2 million dollars overseas for a total of 17.3 million dollars for a movie that cost 900 thousand dollars to make. That is a huge win. Uh, for oh, everyone involved uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 94% uh, fresh rating, and their consistent says passionate and powerfully acted. Fuel Station serves as a celebration of life, a condemnation of death, and a triumph for star Michael B. Jordan. Um, I love that review, <laughs> yeah, I do too. I, um, I uh, Hollywood Reporter called it a compelling de- uh, debut and a powerful dramatic feature film. Uh, uh, they said, as Oscar Jordan at moments gives off vibes of a very young Denzel Washington in the way he combines gentleness and toughness, he effortlessly draws the viewer in toward him. And they also said Diaz is vibrant as his patient and loyal girlfriend, while Spencer brings her gravitas to the proceedings as his um, as his mother. Um, actor Joseph Gordon-Levitt praised the film as the best film of, uh, at the, t- of the 2013 Sundance Film Festival when he was there. And singer oh. Billie Eilish has stated it's her favorite film four years in a row in her annual Vanity Fair interview. Wow. Um, okay. I didn't expect Now, I always, I always like to throw in some either mixed or negative ones to see what you think about what they said. Okay. Um, the, the New York Post gave it a negative review. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then also a subsequent uh, opinion piece in Forbes accused Ryan Coogler of omitting key information and fabricating other scenes in order to manipulate viewers into a distorted impression of depicted events. Okay. Um, you know what? I think, well, it, I think a lot of times in movies that are based on a true story, I think we are to assume because there's certain things that you can't know, like, this is not the best example, because it's, but it is a true story. Like, I, we watch something like The Perfect Storm, which is based on a true story. No one knows or even like the type, well, like something like Titanic, you don't know what happened on the boat. Hey, so, so you're gonna fact. No so, yeah. So and I, and I know like the, with the perfect storm, like they know what happened before they went out on the Andrea Gale, and they kind of have like radio signal stuff and all that, but they don't know what happened on the actual boat. So they have to 
traumatize a lot of that stuff. So I kind of expect that, even if it is based on a true story. Absolutely. Like that it should. I don't think that makes it manipulation. Yeah, no, whatsoever. Um, Variety gave it a mixed review and said it is a well-intentioned attempt to put a human face on the tragic headlines surrounding Oscar Grant. And he praised Michael B. Jordan's performance, but critiqued the relentlessly positive portrayal of the film's subject. He said okay. it's best viewed as he's, at all. yeah. He says it's uh, best viewed as an ode to victims' rights, and it says real Virgo's nuanced drama for heart tugging, head shaking, and rebel rousing. I guess uh, well, well, I don't agree with that either. I but, agree but, with some things. Uh, uh, <laughs> I do not think I never got the impression that it was relentlessly positive by any means at all. And oh. this movie ended up on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 uh, critics' top 10 list of the best films of 2013. Okay. Now, well. what is surprising is that this movie was nominated for a ton of, like, you know, different, like, local, like, uh, Los Angeles Film Critics Awards and Florida Film Critics Awards, Independent Spirit Awards. No um, Oscar nominations, no Golden Globe nominations, no SAG nominations. Are you surprised that it didn't get anything? Um, or even, like, nominations-wise? I'd have to go look through the noms, but like initially hearing that, like, no, I just, because maybe of like the small nature of the movie, um, I'm sure it would have had a big impact, but I mean, it's a limited release. It's a first feature film from Google. Not to say that, you know, debuts can't get Oscar nominations. Maybe I would yeah. say where it's most deserving would be for Michael B. Jordan. Um, yeah. Other than that, no, I'm not surprised to hear something like a movie of this caliber wasn't nominated. But uh, I'd, again, I'd have to maybe look at some of the categories for the nominations and see what it was up against because you know there could be some there that I think this movie would be stronger than. But that doesn't yeah. like shock me, I guess, to hear. But w- what about you? Um, I, I kind of want to do what you're doing, like see what was going on that right. year, and because because it feels like you know that in depending on the year, a performance like Michael B. Jordan's could have like. Not like it'd be a surprise because he's very good, but it could sneak in as a surprise. Kind of reminds me of the whole like Andrew Paul Mescal Roger. thing. Oh, okay. And yeah. Andrew, that well, that both both of those uh, right. where it's like, oh, like you know, they're not really, they're really good, but you're like, oh, I don't know how they're gonna. And dude, her movie was even smaller than uh, <laughs> the Fruitvale yeah, yeah. the Fruitvale Station. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess it to him. Like I wouldn't have been all been upset if he snuck one in at this time because he was really good in the movie. Um, but I was surprised, like just reading and seeing how all the like kind of smaller stuff it got nominated for during that award season. But just no, none of the big ones. But you're right; it's a smaller movie, and there might have been like a ton of competition That's at the time. I'm so thinking, yeah, 2013 and 2014 uh, were both strong, strong years. Yeah, and as far as other, uh, I think you mentioned this earlier. After funding fell through, Octavia Spencer offered to forego her salary to help Ryan Coogler keep to his budget. Nice. Uh, Oscar Grant's real mom, Wanda Jackson, makes a small cameo appearance in the film. She plays Mrs. Stacy at Tatiana's preschool. Uh, footage of a gathering featuring Oscar Grant's daughter, Tatiana, was shot on New Year's Day 2013. It was added a few weeks before its premiere at Sundance. Um, uh, Octavia Spencer had to find investors for the project. One of the first investors she found was Catherine Stockett, her friend since they met in Los Angeles in the early 2000s. Stockett wrote the Oscar-winning role of Minnie in The Help specifically for Spencer, which actually went on to earn uh, Spencer an Academy Award. No, oh, she won for that role. Was that, okay, was the help 2012 or 2013? I think I think that might have been 2012 or 2013, somewhere in there. I, uh, let me look, two, yeah. I think, yeah. But uh, I, I read that too, and I was wondering if it was... Oh, actually, it's, actually uh, I guess that's 2011. But oh, uh, okay. yeah, I guess it would have been around that time. Uh, uh, pro- uh, Forrest Whitaker was also a producer on the project as well. I saw his name in the credits too. I was like, okay, right on. Yep. Awesome. As a first um, director, the that's to... those names being attached as producers to have those names attached to it. Very awesome. yeah. Uh, the Weinstein Company bought the film for two point five million dollars on January twenty first, twenty thirteen, two days after it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, the film was selected for the Sundance Institute Screenwriters Lab in January twenty twelve, and it received a Time Warner Storytelling Fellowship and Cine Reach Project at Sundance Institute grant, as well as that. Um. And then we mentioned earlier the scene where Oscar Grant is shot was filmed at the actual funeral station where the original bullet hole that you mentioned earlier. Uh, that's still so jarring. Oh, I know. Um, Oscar Grant's father is never mentioned. Oscar Grant Jr. is a self-confessed former cocaine dealer who has been in prison since at least September 8th, 1985. He is serving a life sentence at California's Solano State Prison for first-degree murder. 
He was he was permitted to sue Bart for his share of wrongful death payments as of November 2013. His suit was pending. I actually read that because um, he was in prison and wasn't an active part of Oscar's life that they actually denied his uh, uh, him getting any uh, money in a wrongful death suit. But I know that uh, I think the mom and the the mom and the girlfriend settled um, with them for I think I think it was two point eight million dollars, and uh, it's crazy that the cop that shot him got I mean, he was out in eleven months. Uh, I know, I saw that. That was a, the travesty of justice there. That just adds yeah. insult to injury, salt in the wound. Yeah, and like you know, it's the whole. And I th- I guess. You know, because you know, I'm we're this, this is not a law podcast, and I am definitely not a lawyer or anything like that. Right. But I think there's a whole notion of reasonable doubt, and I think what he presented to in his case was like mistaking his. Uh, he thought he was drawing his taser and not his gun, right? And that changed, and that changes. Uh, that was the difference between like first degree murder and then like involuntary manslaughter. Right, manslaughter, and you know, very, very like you know. So it's the. Uh, it's yeah, and I and that is what makes so many people more upset when these things happen because it's you know, Oscar Grant loses his life at twenty two, doesn't come back from that. Right. Not saying that this cop's life is going to be great because I'm sure since then he hasn't been able to do. Uh, yeah, <laughs> certainly. There's you know his life would have changed absolutely for the worse as well, but uh, it pales in comparison to the consequences that Oscar Grant faced. But uh, yeah. I, and, yeah, I guess I'll I'll keep my opinion <laughs> myself about that particular joke, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely unfortunate, and especially how it's portrayed in the movie. I, I, there's a little sense of a little bit more maliciousness there that you would have liked to have seen some accurate retribution. But I can I mean, understand just... the defense as well. It's one of those complicated matters. There's never really going to be a resolution that leaves yeah. everyone happy, unfortunately. Like so many, I agree. But yeah, definitely. Um, well, yeah, that's another uh, anniversary episode for you guys. Uh, I know this was a, a little bit more of a serious one, yeah, uh, somber one, but a good discussion about uh, a different type of movie, which is I, you know, important for us to have on here because yeah, you know, that's right. And a first they all, for, they all, for you and I, really more serious, yeah, sort of movie like this. So I'm glad we got through it. Uh, yeah, pleasure. We uh, yeah yeah we do we do have uh, you know we. You'll hear this one on Monday. You already heard what anniversary ones are coming up. We had already list mm-hmm. Freedville Station, but we still have uh, your pick of Pirates of the Caribbean coming up Can't soon. Can't celebrate 20 and, years. Uh, that'll be a fun one. I actually haven't watched that movie in so long, and that'll be a fun one to talk about because, dude, my expectations were to the floor when that movie came out because I was like, <laughs> I don't really like pi- I, don't, <laughs> I don't really like pirate shit, and I don't uh, I don't love Disneyland, so I wasn't even like obsessed with like. The ride, so yeah, that'll be a yeah. that'll be a that was a pleasant surprise when it came out twenty years ago, um, and then we also have Halloween H two O coming up uh, in this month as well with like we mentioned Mark J Parker will be on the go to guy for late nineties teen movies <laughs> to be on with us can't wait uh, also also Freddy versus Jason and uh, we also will have the OC I can't decide for the OC if it should just be us or if I should grab one person um, but uh, either way it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, well, if anybody listening is interested in joining us for that conversation, I might not have too much to contribute where I haven't seen it. So I think we could benefit from uh, having another parody on. But uh, if not, I'm sure we'll get through it no problem. But I'm excited to check that yep. series out. So August is going to be busy for us. Um, but in the meantime, yeah, very busy. <laughs> hopefully we got enough content for you guys to stay satisfied. Thanks, as always, for uh, tuning into the channel, guys, week after week. We love hearing your feedback. Um, this has been episode 112, as we mentioned covering 10 years of Fruitvale Station. Definitely check it out. comes highly recommended from both of us here at the podcast if you haven't seen it yet. As Gaius mentioned, uh, stay tuned. Soon, uh, right around the corner, we have uh, celebrating 20 years of Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl, getting that episode out to you guys as soon as possible. Um, Until then, you guys know where to find us, anywhere on social media or where you get your podcasts, especially on the new playlist app. You can find us at Back to the Blockbuster. This has been episode 112. Fruitvale Station turns 10 years old. Thanks a lot for tuning in, guys. Gas, always a pleasure. I will see you later this week. Yep. Peace. Peace out, guys.